Tune it is right at that edge where two and a half seconds, although it's painful, you can tune the internet protocol. So you can have TCP with the right size windows and the maximum packet sizes and stuff. And it'll work. It'll be kind of painful. You click a link in the web browser and seven seconds later, 10 seconds later, the next page loads. But it's not that bad, honestly, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you can do it. it. It's not like with Mars where it turns into an hour later. I mean, there's that three-way handshake before it starts sending data. You send the message, you send the message, you send the message, and then it starts sending data which doesn't seem like a big thing on the internet to send three messages before you start. But if it's three minutes, it's nine minutes before the first byte of data comes back to you. That doesn't work. But the people who are saying, yeah, that you can tune TCP to work there, they're right. You can. It's not a deal. If you're starting on a clean piece of paper to make a protocol to work on a two and a half second latency link, I think you wouldn't exactly come up with TCP. I think you'd do a few things different, but it would work. Yeah. Is it possible to get internet to Mars with UDP? I'd say no. So there's a big difference between the moon and Mars. So the moon is two and a half seconds away and Mars is, you know, three to 12 minutes away and sometimes blocked by the sun. So different game. I mean, you can get packets that technically follow the internet spec to Mars with UDP, but it takes minutes to get there. Not one app that we have today using UDP will stream stuff for minutes across a link to Mars without getting one message back from the other side. People keep saying, well, there's Quick. Oh, well, you know, Quick expects an answer within 30 seconds to hear the other guys listening. RTMP that streams one way on UDP, but it actually also creates a TCP socket to ask, how's it going? And if it doesn't hear anything for three minutes, I'm telling you, it'll have long since stopped the video. WebRTC, the same thing. All these protocols that we use today over UDP, none of them would work trying to communicate to another planet. The software would give up in every case. To do anything useful, you need to do something different, or you need to do layers of smarter software that understands, hey, the other guy might be minutes away. Way, minutes of latency and still do something useful. It's not software you can download off the internet today, not the normal software, no web browser or whatever. So you need different software. And that's where NASA and you know, other organizations have created these new protocols for you know hauling things where the delay of minutes and going to you know, the far side of the solar system. So there are a couple protocols. The top one is bundle protocol for sending bundles of information there. And it'll take a long time. So take it with a zip file, an email attachment you send off. Underneath that, they run another protocol called LTP, Lick Lighter Transport Protocol. Lick Lighter was one of the first and greatest computer science professors. He was at MIT. He was born in 1910. He was one of the first people who dreamed up the concept that someday computers would have graphical user interfaces. He had nothing to do with the protocol. I think just the people naming the protocol had a great deal of respect for him. And this is a protocol that instead of TCP, instead of UDP, although it's very flexible, you can actually run it on top of UDP, on top of AOS, which is a protocol made specifically for talking to satellites. It gives you links between the two, but it's pretty different because it's made for massive latency. So LTP will do things like when it starts sending, it just starts sending. There's no handshake to say, are you there? When its radio tells it or its laser, whatever the data link layer is, it waits till it says good to go and then starts sending. And there's no negotiation of speed. TCP has all these messages saying, oh, you're going too fast, slow down. There's none of that. It doesn't expect to hear back from the other side. It sends at the speed of its radio, at the speed of its laser. Whatever speed is, it sends it. You got to be ready to catch it because it might have been, you know, if you're at a Pluto or something, right? And now we're talking hours. So you can't have any like waiting for the other guy to confirm it. he's there. The other neat thing about this protocol, it's not in TCP, it's not UDP, is that data can be marked as red or green. And red data, very important. It must get through. So when it sends red data, it first says, I'm sending red data. And then at the end it says, end of red data. That block of data, it has to hold on to until it does get a confirmation from the other guy. So that's sitting memory. So it needs enough memory to hold however much red data. So not everything can be red data. And the green data is data that it hopes gets through, but it's sending and moving on. And so often important commands to control the spaceship will be red data. But the pictures that the spaceship takes with its camera, that's green data. And if you miss it, if you don't have the dish pointed at it at the right time to pick it up when it sends a picture, you probably lost the picture. That's life, right? I mean, it would take you know minutes or hours to get the message back and how much memory is on the spaceship to hold all these pictures for hours and hours. So a lot of data, green data, just gets sent and then it's gone. So there are a lot of neat things like that built into the protocol. It's very different than just saying you you use UDP or tune TCP. It's got like real smarts for the situation of dealing with really long latency. But you're not going to be able to just use the internet like normal. on it, Right. You're not going to be able to. You need apps that are built on top of LTP and they would be different because I think about BitTorrent or email as apps that probably could be modified to work on top of it. You send messages 
messages and they sit in the queue and hopefully when you get a link, it manages to send them. And then when an answer comes back, they show up in your inbox and maybe it's hours after they were sent. But a web browser, when you're clicking links and you're expecting the page to pop up, it's hopeless. It's just a different way. Browsers are built around this assumption of low latency. Uh, that's just not a real assumption when you're out in the solar system. How would something like Netflix work with LTP? It would send you a list occasionally of movies available and you would check the ones you're interested in. It would actually work a lot more like Netflix back when they sent you the DVDs. You would check which movies you're interested in and it would send it back. And then as the link works and there isn't important data to send, it would send back the movies as bundles. But when you get all the bundles that made a movie back, then boop, available to watch. So someday when we've colonized the moon and Mars, the moon will be a part of the Earth's internet. When, when they hit Twitter, they'll be hitting the same Twitter. They'll be a few seconds behind because that's speed of light. But it'll be the same internet. Just kind of slow. But Mars, Mars will be its own Mars net. And we'll use protocols like Bundle Protocol and LTP to, you know, ship content back and forth. But no one's going to be browsing the Mars net from Earth and Moon. So if it's so hard to stream data that far, how did they live stream the moon landing back in the 60s? Well, they have this studio in LA. <laughs> now, that was all analog, right? So they had an analog transmitter transmitting analog video, like NTSC, and they had huge dishes on Earth pointed at it. It streamed down and was captured by the dishes. It wasn't divided up into packets. If a dish wasn't pointing at it, it was gone forever. I mean, it was sent out and it went out as light waves. And either you were looking at it and picked it up with a huge dish or you didn't and it was gone forever, right? There's no caching. There's no resending. All the cool things from streaming protocols where you get to drag back and look what happened before or not. It was just sent and received or not. So why doesn't quantum entanglement work for faster than light internet? I don't know where people got this idea that you could use quantum entanglement to talk fast and speed light. We must have had 30 comments on our last couple of videos all mentioning, just use quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement cannot be used to send information fast and speed of light. There are weird effects with it. Spooky action at a distance. As Einstein said, you know, if two people observe the same thing, their observations end up being linked that they see similar things. But the only way to know what the other person saw and when they looked at it is to send a message back and ask them what they saw and then they say, send a message back to you. And then you realize, oh, that's a creepy story. It's almost like the two things were communicating, but it's in no way useful. There's no way to send even one bit of information to the other person through quantum entanglement. It just doesn't work. So the linked particles do change do faster change. than the speed of light? Yes. But they don't change in the same way? Oh. In a way that's useful. Yeah. So th there's a funny thing in quantum physics that actually does send some information faster than the speed of light, which is quantum tunneling. Turns out if you shoot an electron at, at a wall of metal, if it's fast enough, every once in a while, it'll go through the wall. And they've been timing it more and more accurately. And it turns out it actually teleports to the other side of the wall. Fast and speed of light. But the odds of it going through the wall fall off based on the cube of the thickness of the wall. So if the wall is even as thick as a piece of aluminum foil, it'll take so many tries to get an electron through there that statistically you're always faster just sending a radio around the wall, which is kind of strange. But apparently on a tiny enough scale, an electron going through one atom seems like momentarily you get this weird effect where sometimes it does seem to go fast on the speed of light. But again, doesn't turn out to be useful. It's only at the tiniest scales. Make sure you subscribe for more connectivity tech discussions like this one.